Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Inquisitive Brain Podcast. I'm Shaw, your host. This is a show that brings you interviews and insights from all walks of life on the reality of being. I'm going to be talking to Carrie Roy today. She's a psychic from New Orleans and one of my favorite cities. Uh, And she's had a lot of press. She's been on the Biography Channel, A&E Channel, Discovery Plus, uh, lots of the travel channels and the Today Show in the U.S. She's recognized as New Orleans' most accomplished psychic medium. And she's got over 40 years professional experience. So Carrie is featured in documentaries about psychic development. And she's written a book, Awaken Your Intuition, Empowering Women for Success in Life and Business. It's her first book through Mojo Rising Media. And she's also a rescue pet mama. So she loves to rescue animals. She's a real animal lover. She's also connected to Big Easy Animal Rescue, B-E-A-R, and New Orleans Women's and Children's Shelter. So I'm really happy to have her on the show. You know that I uh, like to talk about uh, all things spiritual, and I do work as a medium myself. It's skills that I had naturally since I was a child. It wasn't something that I was frightened of or anything. And, you know, I always say these things, this is a belief system. I believe in what I'm doing. Um, It just happened. And so I continue to do it. And I know because I see the effect and change it has on people. I don't solicit readings. So I do not just give a reading um, just for any purpose. You have to approach me. You have to apply to have a reading, so I'm just not out in the street or in public giving readings. I don't believe in that, actually. Um, I I find it invasive, and I don't believe in doing that. I think it's unprofessional and it's invasive. And so what I do as a professional is I allow people to come to me. I have turned people away, and I do continue to turn people away, depending on if I think uh, that I'm not the one to do the reading, or there could be many other reasons. So I, you know, it doesn't happen often, but sometimes I just don't believe uh, the I, I want to do the reading. It's for many different reasons. But today I'm talking about Carrie. It's lovely to get other psychic mediums' view on the work they do, how they do it, uh, how it all happened for them. What I found by speaking with Carrie today is that Essentially, we want to help people. That's why we do the work. We connect with spirit and we want to do the work because we know that it can affect some change. It can help people to heal or help to facilitate a different connection with their purpose in life on this earth plane whilst they're here now, how they may approach their own lives, and also their view of their lives and other people's lives whilst they're here. Of course, the other thing is that she's from New Orleans. So it's it's so good, New Orleans, I mean. And so it's so good to hear her take on things. Uh, We talk about cemeteries. You know, I grew up walking through cemeteries. I've never been afraid. I've never been afraid of a cemetery. We talk about misconceptions as well. We talk about why people may fear this or fear spirits or and I think there's something to do with control if you see a human being it's a misconception though because you see a human being in the physical form in front of you you perhaps you feel as though you can control what happens but actually unfortunately as we know we do not control other people so you you are not it's a misconception you're not controlling someone else but with spirit, people think they're really out of control because it's a spirit and that something bad's going to happen to them. I'm not quite sure where that's come from. I think it's, I think the movies, as, as uh, Carrie will talk about, maybe film, media, movies has, uh, you know, Poltergeist, The Exorcist, all of those uh, popular programs or, or t- um movies perpetuate the idea that it's all frightening and scary and so 
you know, I've, I've never had that view. I've never, okay, I've had some dubious experiences, <laughs> but nothing. Mm, I was going to say nothing to be afraid of. I wasn't afraid. What I would say is I was shook a little bit or I had to regain my composure. Maybe that's it. Um, so, yeah, some some things can happen where you go, ooh, hang on, <laughs> hang on a second. Ooh, wait a minute now. Uh, however, they, they've been okay. I did have a period of my life where I believe um, a lot of, I put some, I put my psychicness on the back burner and it was a few years whereby I was very, let's say this, I was very into my human experience. I was really trying to navigate a human experience. Um, and so I put the psychicness on the back burner. However, spirit didn't. Spirit said, yeah, you need to get out of that or do this, do you know, I had I had that connection. I just knew. I started, I I knew things, so it never left. It's just that I didn't really talk to people about what I could do or what I saw or what I what what was happening. And funnily enough, I believe that was the right thing to do. And really, I've never been someone to go around and say I'm psychic. Never. It depends on the person, though. Some people you have an immediate connection with, and you can say, yeah, I'm psychic, I'm a medium. But some people I would just never even say it. My intuition is my internet. That's my Google, my intuition. I can sit with someone or see someone and know pretty much what I need to know. So let's welcome Carrie to the show. Carrie, it's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's so happy to be here. So I'm really excited to talk about your work. Um, that's one thing we have in common. But the reason why I like to have other mediums on the show is to get your experience and your training and your what you do and how you help people. So I'd like to start out just by asking, when did you learn that you had psychic skills and also mediumship? gifts or skills well you know they happened around the same time in my life um around eight that that time between eight to ten years old i had two experiences that really let not only me know what was going on it let my elders know and that was perhaps more important so that they could then in turn help me to understand what was going on um, it happened with a storm um, in a psychic way. There was a, it was a regular day, and all of a sudden I had this knowing that a storm was coming, and this was way before uh, there were announcements and, you know, newscasters telling you updates of what weather was going to happen, and it was just a regular old day. And then I had said something to my mother and sure enough, a big tropical storm came, and, and so I was accurate about picking the weather. So it, it was a very inconsequential thing, but it was what gave them a heads up that I was prescient. Mm -hmm. um, in my medium ability, that happened a little ways uh, longer. I mean, I was a little older when it happened, and I was walking down Royal Street with my mother, and I all of a sudden uh, saw the street packed with people, and I thought that it was Mardi Gras, although it was in the middle of the summer, but the way it looked, it all of a sudden looked like there were a lot of people there in costume. Um, I found out later that it wasn't in anybody in costume. It's just that because it was people from different time periods, it looked like they were dressed up in costumes, but it was just that there were spirits there from 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, and it just... I saw a bunch of people and fainted, and that was what happened in my first medium experience. Again, I was very fortunate because I had uh, family members. My mother was a medium and a psychic, my grandfather a numerologist and an astrologer. And so when I started showing my abilities, they were able to kind of steer that along and help me understand what was happening. That is amazing. How exciting, though, that I could picture the scene as you were talking about it. Oh, thank uh, you. Yes. 
But also, isn't that lovely that your family were already all-knowing in that way? They kind of knew that what to do, how to nurture you, perhaps. And so, I was so lucky, yeah. Oh, so many people, as we know, really don't have that for many reasons, religious yeah. mostly. Sure. And New Orleans, which our, our listeners, our viewers will, if you've listened to any of my shows, you know that my family is from New Orleans. So I'm, I'm beyond excited to be speaking with Carrie today. Um, oh. It's a very um, spiritual city, isn't it? I mean, heavily Catholic, we have to say. Uh, that's a predominant force, isn't it? Yes. In New Orleans? Yes. yes. Yeah, we all genuflect when we walk by the church still to this day. It's just ingrained in who Absolutely. we are. Absolutely. We make the sign of the cross driving yeah. when we pass the church. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but it's also very known for its spiritual and psychic and mediumship. And also, um, what word can I use? I will say natural. <laughs> it's easy. I'm being kind. Uh, voodoo, um, also, yeah. you know, very heavily known for that. Um, my family, some of my family certainly knew how to do things. So, yeah. yeah. So what's it like? What was it like for you growing up as a child in New Orleans with all that activity happening? Well, it, it was busy, right? I mean, it's just there is so much going on on so many different levels. One of the things, just the basic things that I describe to people is in, in our city, the cemeteries are part of the neighborhood. They haven't been moved. I mean, we do have um, cemeteries in the suburbs, too, but really we still have the cemeteries are right there, right smack in the middle of your neighborhood. You grow up knowing that the dead are there and that the dead are part of our lives. And so um, there is a big uh, just regular connection that we have. We have, you know, the day that we get together, the 1st of November, 2nd of November, which All Saints and then All Souls Day, and we go to the cemeteries and we spend time with our ancestors right there on the gravesites, you know. Um, you can't bury underground because the water levels are so high, but we have these beautiful mausoleums and it's just really something that we incorporate in our day-to-day -day lives. And that's that's just one of the basic differences. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that alone, though, can help to allay some fears because so many people fear mediumship. They fear psychicness. Why do you think people fear it? We've been conditioned to fear this. There are basic um, power structures that we have in place that don't really want people to be able to feel their own power. They don't want people to be able to answer their own questions. And they certainly don't want people to go to other people who are not part of that system to find answers. And so anybody who has been outside of a particular you know, social uh, structure structures and constructs, uh, who is providing information often gets uh, scapegoated and gets pushed away because we can't have a populace who is empowered, right? I mean, we could go way into that, but I think that really is the basis of it. And that is that um, it is uh, perhaps dangerous to have people empowered and knowing what, what the right direction for their own life is. Yes, absolutely. And what do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions about what a medium does? What do people think about it that's actually not true? Well, a lot of them think that we're in league with the devil. Yeah. <laughs> Just right, let's cut to the chase, right? Um, I get emails and have for, at this point, decades from uh, people that trying to save my soul because they believe that I am somehow connected to some dark forces and um, again, in league with the devil, a Satanist, a de demonologist, all of this stuff. Um, it's very, very uh, big thing that people 
believe that we're associated with that always. Now, I'm not judgmental. If you believe in your religion, if you have a pagan natural based religion, that's great. But it's something that I have been accused of being, again, in league with the devil. Um, more times than I can even count. And so perhaps that is one of the big misconceptions, right, is that we are somehow um, really uh, using bad energy to communicate with what it is that we're presenting, and that just isn't true at all. You know that. Uh, most of us do, but there is a segment that really still lines that stuff up. Absolutely. Yes, that's probably the number one misconception, as you mentioned, that somehow we're not actually hearing spirit, we're hearing the devil, or we're yeah. hearing a demon. Um, interesting, uh, you know, interesting. Well, I'm in the South, right? New Orleans is part of the Deep South, and in the Deep South, it's something that perhaps uh, is a little bit more prevalent in in believing that those of us who do this are are in league with some kind of, uh, yeah, different negative energies. Uh, but I think that is one of them. I, I think the other thing um, that I feel is, is that we all walk around just hearing spirits talking to us all the time. And that that is something that is uh, made kind of famous in TV shows that portray mediums and things like that. And so it's a device that is used often in television. And so people just assume that at, when I'm in the grocery and I'm standing next to somebody that all of their deceased relatives are constantly talking to me. And that's just not the way it works for me. Um, but it's something that I have been asked uh, numerous times. So I think that that is also, in my experience, something that people just assume is something that happens with us. Yes, that's a really good one, actually. And you're right, the media has and television movies even. Um, yeah, I, I think in order to do this professionally, right, um, and in order to do this in the long term, that we have to be able to turn it on and off. That's one thing that my elders taught me because they understood that if you don't have the ability to turn it off, that you'd probably go crazy, right? Um, and I think that there are people that can't turn it off, and I my heart breaks for them because I know just how disruptive that could be in somebody's life. But I'm with you. As as much as I know and have, and have trained even others to be able to turn it on and off, there are bleed-throughs that occur that it, if the information is really important, it just comes no matter what we're doing. Absolutely, yes. And I suppose that is maybe another misconception that um, we, what we get, um, I, how do I put this? When things come through to us, we're making it up or we're a cold reading is the word I'm Oh, yeah. But you look at me. I look at you. I can kind of tell if you're smiling that you're in a good mood. If you are frowning, you're in a bad mood. That's cold reading, right? Um, I think that what has happened is that there are a lot of psychic mediums that just go up on that hill and are willing to die on that hill, and I'm not. Cold reading is not reading. Reading what we do as psychics and mediums is going way beyond vis visible cues, visible, um, uh, yeah, the instances that we're picking up from people just by the way they look. I, I think that... The details that we get, the information, the really personal connections that we make with people are way above and beyond what a cold read is. And the magnificent connections that we're able to make that are above and beyond what um, is uh, happens in normal use of the senses. And luckily, there's a lot of scientific research that is catching up with this and is in support of this. And so I think that I would hope that we will get beyond that and be able to focus more on what it is that we actually do do. And that is we have a totally different relationship with like the world of time and space than a lot of other people do. Absolutely. And that brings me to the process that you have. So um, 
for me, you know, I ground, I take some time to meditate and all of that before I go on a platform. And in the UK, spiritualist churches are huge. So a lot of mediums go into spiritualist churches and they'll do um, an evening of clairvoyance. And so we stand there and we don't know anyone and we give messages out to people. So before I do that, I don't, you know, I always take some time, and relax and all that. Preparation. Is there anything that you do regularly that you feel helps to support your work? I, I do believe that meditation is key. I, I think for all of us um, that it's it really is like the push-up that you can do as a psychic medium that is going to make your ability stronger. I've, I've been meditating now um, really in earnest since the 70s, and I really credit that as perhaps the number one tool that we can use to um, get ourselves prepared to be the vessels and be the channels of information that we are. Uh, I I do grounding exercises. I think that we, as psychic mediums, spend so much time kind of out of the body that it's important to bring ourselves into the body and make sure that we're connected to the earth to provide those messages to people who are here. You know, and so those are just two things that I would say um, are really important in my growth and and my preparation for reading other people yes excellent so i want to just jump quickly to your book uh because i really want to talk about it it's exciting actually because we do need to know this information a lot of people will like this so the book is called uh listeners awaken your intuition so there's a lot of talk about intuition but awaken your intuition empowering women for success in life and business, which I love, because that's often missed, I think. You know, there's all this um, talk about getting to the next level, but how are you empowered to do it? So what motivated you to write this book on this topic? Oh, well, thank you so much for asking. This is near and dear to my heart, because I've been working on this book uh, for I would say it's a good 40 years in the making. Um, the title I, I came up with a 25 years ago and just have sat on it. And um, I, it's my time to do it. And I, I feel like it is the time to do it because we really need to, in the crazy, stressful, hectic world that we live in, I really feel that intuition is something that we can hold on to that will help us navigate uh, everything that's going on in our lives. And I, I wrote this specifically for women. I think that there's a lot of stuff out there in the manosphere, right? There's, you've got Jordan Peterson, you've got Rogan, you've got a whole bunch of guys out there talking about stuff in the manosphere. I really wanted to speak to women um, because we really are so naturally connected to our intuition. And I just wanted to give us the tools that we need to flourish and to grow and to be able to really use something that is innately ours. Yes. And um, now, when you were writing the book, though, did you feel as though some of the information was being sort of channeled through you or were you getting inspiration or was it all based on experience or did you feel there was a, a little help? I, I would say it was really kind of like a gumbo of all that stuff, right? Um, it was absolutely inspirational. I'm not a, a trained author, and so I, I feel that it was in many ways divinely inspired that I was able to create a book. It is just miraculous to me, and I know that there were all my ancestors and all my angels and all of my guides right behind me assisting me in this process. Uh, so I would say a lot of it did just come on through. Uh, and it was, uh, of course, reflective on the career that I've had as a professional psychic medium here in New Orleans. Um, again, since I, I started in about 85 reading professionally. And so I did take a lot of experience that I've had with myself with clients and incorporated that into the book as well. 
That's fantastic. And what's a big takeaway that people will uh, get once they read the book? Will, will they come away feeling, what will they come away feeling, thinking? Well, I would hope that they come away when they finish reading this book, knowing that intuition is something that you can really put to use in your day-to-day -day life and make what happens better. It, it is not just this woo-woo stuff that's out there. It is something that can help you with a job, help you with a relationship, help you with your children, help you with, you know, anxiety, help you with all becoming an entrepreneur. I mean, these are real applicable things that you can do in your day-to-day -to, -day to live a richer, fuller life. And that's what I'm hoping is the biggest takeaway, is that I've been doing this a long time, but everybody has this ability. And if you devote some time and some energy and some practice to it, you too can use this with confidence. Excellent. I like what you said about that as well, because I know a lot of people Certainly, whenever I do spiritual development or psychic development, they, they think that it should all happen at once, all at once. They should be clairvoyant, clairsentient, clairaudient. They think they should have all the clairs or it should all flow at once. And I try and encourage people that it does take time and that you're not working alone. You're working with spirit. So relax. <laughs> You know, and just allow, as you spoke about the focus before, the focus should be on what's coming through, not can I do this? It should be relax, let it all come through. Let, let's see what happens. i just like to remind you all to click that like button wherever you're listening, wherever you're watching on YouTube. Leave us a comment. It really does help with the algorithm and to push the podcast forward. If you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or any streaming platform, please do the same. Like the video, share it as well, and leave us a five-star review or any review, whatever you're thinking. Feedback is welcome. Thank you for your support. What was it like for you when you were developing as such? Well, it was interesting because it started fairly young with me. Again, I, my ability started becoming recognized between 8 and 10 years old. Uh, and so until I was, I'd say, about 15, uh, I really learned a lot from my elders, and that included meditation, visualization, exercises, learning tarot, learning palms, seances, dream interpretation, astrology, numerology. And it really was pretty intense until I was about 15 years old. And then um, a, a couple of things happened. My mother was killed when I was a teenager, and she was my primary teacher. Um, and so that interrupted what was happening to me through family um, experiences. Uh, then also, I, I didn't really understand at that point that this would be a career. There weren't a lot of people that were really doing this in a full-time way. You had people like Gene Dixon, who wrote the uh, you know, horoscopes for the Reagans and stuff. I mean, there really wasn't a lot of people out there to have as an example. You had spiritualist churches, but there weren't a lot of full-time psychics and mediums, very rare. And so I went off and actually started in the music business, completely different industry. And so um, from, from I would say the time that I was about 16 until I was in my early 20s, I didn't really give it that big a thought. I always kept into it, always was interested, always read books on it, always, if I had a question for myself, would pull the cards and take a look. And, you know, then I had a woman who knew me in the music business who knew that I did this and understood tarot palm, all of that. And she asked me if I could do it professionally. And that's what opened the door. And she had a gig. And so I started doing that. And then that was it for, I would say, a couple of years. I went back and forth between music and reading. And then I left music in about 1985 and just devoted all of my energy to being a professional psychic and medium. That's incredible. And 
I know that you are listed. Is it BBC America as the psychic medium to go to? In the U.S., yeah. Yeah, it In was US. something that came out. Yeah, bbcamerica.com. Um, there was an article that came out, I I don't even know how many years ago. It must be probably about a decade now. Um, and it came out and it listed me as the psychic and medium to see the best one in the U.S. So that was pretty exciting. It is exciting. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk just for a moment about the logistics of how we're able to connect. Because I always say to people, look, this may seem like magic, but it isn't. I think um, human beings are mir miraculous anyway, but we connect with an energy or energies that pass. But can you explain to the listeners how the process happens for you. Sure. Um, when I was young, uh, it would feel as though information was coming into the back of my head at the base of my skull. Uh, it would be as though something was feeding electrical energy and I could feel it. It would just come in and it would like make the whole back of my head tingle. And I'd feel that and I'd be like, okay, something's going to happen. Uh, something's, something is coming through. And I learned uh, how to channel that and use cards, palm, other ways to kind of take what was coming in and I was receiving at the base of my skull. I know it sounds a little weird, but uh, that was how it happened for me. And so I just, one of the greatest gifts that I was given as a child is I was told not to critique the information as it's coming through. I was told to let it flow. There's something called stream of consciousness in writing. And there are examples of that, you know, James Joyce, other writers who would just let the information flow through them, right? And so that's really what my ancestors taught me. Get it, let it flow through you, let it come through you. You can critique it afterwards, but don't critique it while you're doing it. And I think that was one of the best pieces of information, the greatest gift that they gave me. Because it sounds crazy when this information comes out. You know, I've said some crazy things to people that have sounded off the wall that ended up happening. If I had stopped myself when it was coming through me and not said it, then I would not have been able to provide them with important information that they needed. Um, there was an example of that. There was a woman who came to see me years ago. She was from a little small town in Texas, and I told her that I kept seeing her in Paris, France insane i said this is going to sound so crazy and she thought i was literally out of my mind five years later the woman showed up she in fact ended up in paris she had become a hairstylist and she ended up meeting somebody who took her there and if i had really stopped and not told her that because i thought i was sounding crazy then she wouldn't have gotten the reading that she deserved right so um when we look at especially mediumship, I think. And, you know, sometimes when people want a psychic reading, they say, oh, but don't tell me anything bad, or I don't want to have anything bad. What What's your take on that? Well, you know, it's, life is full of all sorts of stuff, you know. Um, I I certainly am an honest reader. I, I don't shy away from saying things that aren't unpleasant. Um, I do not want to tell somebody when they're going to die or when their mother's going to die or when this person's going to die. I might be able to do that, but I'm not going to do that because it serves no purpose for anybody. And I've told people sometimes you better get ready and, you know, whatever you need to say. If you need to say something, say it now. But there are ways that you can take information that perhaps is not what somebody wants to hear and give it to them in a way that's kind and give it to them in a way where they still feel like they are empowered and that they have choices on how they react and respond to something that's happening in their life. I, I think that 
I don't know everything and I don't want to know everything, but I do know a lot and I'm willing to share that with everybody. But I know that there are some readers that really kind of get off on this power trip of, of saying negative things about people's lives as though they're, you know, kind of, I've just heard a lot of doom and gloom stuff second hand has come to me that I've had to clean up that other readers have said to to clients. And I believe be honest, but always be kind. Uh, be honest, but always be empowering. So I, that's kind of my take on it. Mm-hmm. That's lovely. Um, because after all, it well, I believe it's a spiritual, it's spiritual work we're doing. So we're looking for to help to encourage healing or to help to facilitate some type of healing and hopefully to make people's lives just a little bit lighter or that they see a little bit clearer as they go on their daily walk or something that's empowering as opposed to debilitating. Yes. And yeah, so that they're worried. Which brings me to the issue of... um, demons coming through or sometimes people will say oh has anything scary happened to you so i'll ask you has anything scary happened to you anything frightening um, i've had some wild things happen yes I've, I've had things happen um in in my uh work as a paranormal investigator over the years i've i've stumbled across some things that are not that pleasant but i must say that that is actually not the norm most often the the beings and the spirits that you connect with are not negative entities they're positive they're watching over us they're protective but every once in a while you'll come across something that perhaps uh, is not the happiest of energies and that's happened a couple times i've i've had uh i've been fortunate that i've never stumbled on the gates of hell in any of my investigations but i've i've come across people who aren't happy about what happened to them and you try to speak with them and reason with them and facilitate them being able to move on to whatever is their next place but i think that drama and fear and that's very marketable right i mean fear sells and so most of the stuff that you see on tv about this is going to scare you Mm -hmm. because that's what sells that's so that's what makes the commercials pay for them you know so it's something that people are afraid of that isn't actually as frequent as you would imagine I would say the scariest thing that's ever happened that really freaked me out is that there was a a doll that I literally saw that was uh, being moved all sorts of weird ways. I know it sounds very innocuous, a doll, but in the circumstance, it was weird. And it was one of the strangest physical manifestations that I saw. And it was right in front of me and there was no wires and it was really wild. But um, I, I, I think that that was the strangest physical evidence that I'd ever seen. I I've certainly had um, anomalies on film that that are are difficult to explain. But the really scary stuff, the poltergeist kind of stuff, the Amityville horror kind of stuff. I am so fortunate not to have had a lot of that, even in the most haunted of, of U.S. cities. It, it It's really not something where I'm afraid. You, you mentioned the cemeteries before, and it's one of the reasons why I'm not afraid of cemeteries is because of New Orleans. It, it's just, as you say, they're everywhere. Yeah. And- Sometimes you walk through them if you're going to the shops or if you're going to school or something. So it's yeah. never a frightening experience. Um, and those energies are there. I mean, if you're a medium, you, there's a good high chance that walking, you're going to hear something. You're going to, which brings me to what would you say your primary psychic skill is? Clairaudience, clairsentience, your 
Thank you. I just know. I just know stuff. You know, at this point, it has morphed probably into its own little distilled way of Claire. It's just I know stuff. And yeah. that's the best way I can describe it to people. It isn't really hearing things anymore, seeing things in particular. It's just you know it. And it may be coming partially from Claire audience. It may be coming partially from Claire sentience, Claire, but all of the Claire's, right? But I think it just at this point, it's just a feeling that I know. Right. Like I've read that book or I've read that book before and now I'm giving you the synopsis. Yes. Okay. So it might be a combination of all of them. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, you know, I have a friend, Ruthie Phillips. She was on the show and she, her primary skill is clairvoyant. She sees everything. So she calls yeah. herself a clairvoyant medium. So some people do have, a, you know, one skill that's really strong. Um, but yet, like yourself, I get all of them and it just depends um, on how you feel, how I'm feeling that day. I think. Yeah. 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 What's going on for me? What's going on for spirit, the guides. You know, one thing that I'm asked all the time is do I work with one guy? So what, what's your, your take on spirit guides and how they are around mediums or, how mediums might interact. You know, it's that's an interesting thing. Coming up, I certainly worked with guides. I, I that is, I think, an essential part of training. That some of my mentors were all were in spirit form, right? I had I had real human here in in form mentors, but I also had spirit mentors, and those are my guides. And I did use them and work with them perhaps more when I was younger. Um, now I I know that they're there. I know they're around, but it isn't just one. Um, and I know some wonderful readers, mediums who have that partnership with one guide and they, they do all of their work with that one guide or in, um, with, uh, Sanaya Rahman is an example. Jane uh, Roberts with Seth Speaks. They had one guide that they worked with. Um, but for me, I really don't. I, again, it's just, it's like a knowing now, and it's probably coming from lots of different guides, but it, it isn't one in particular for me. Yes, I, I yeah, for me as well. Um, but it is interesting. There are people, as you say, who there seems to be that partnership and they go to one one guide um yeah i worked on a tv show in the uk for uh, over a year and there was one guy who stayed with me particularly during that time and when i left the show i the, the connection was go you know he was gone but he was very prominent um i could feel his energy i could see him everything but then that was it. So that was it. Yeah, that's my experience. That I think he helped during that. It was, it was my first TV show, not first time on TV, but first time doing psychic readings on TV. And I think he was there to help with that. Oh, I love that. Yes, yes. I've had some. I've had some that really stand out still to this day. That I that I connected with fifty years ago. There's one named Keen. Um, and uh, he was a, an Irish singer, um, and I connected with him. He was around a lot at a, you know when I was a kid, and I don't know if I haven't tuned into him for a long time, but he was very, very important during you know part of my development. And so I think that the same way we have friends that we connect with in this life and we hang out with and maybe they move to another city or we move to another city or something happens and we don't see each other with regularity anymore. I think the same thing can happen with our friends in spirit. Absolutely. Now, one thing that a lot of people ask as well is why is it that some of the, sometimes we give information and it maybe won't happen or why some mediums tend to get names and dates and places and all that stuff and then some mediums don't. So I ask every medium that comes on the show, what, what's their take on this? What do you think about this? And why is that the case? 
I, I feel like everybody has their own flavor, right? Um, it's uh, that there are people that are are really wonderful as uh, tarot card readers. There are people that are wonderful as palm readers. There are people that are wonderful um, at being able to forecast stock uh, stock picks. There are some people that can tell you who your kid is going to marry. I think we all have our geniuses. And so some people are going to uh, receive information in a different way than another person will be. And why that is, is because we're all different. Um, I, In my experience and working with clients over the years and knowing readers over the years, we, we tend to all be getting about the same information. It's just how we get it may be a little different. Um, had somebody come in to me the other day and she's like, yeah, you know, this other person told me the exact same thing that you're telling me, although we went and got it in very different ways, right? The information that we were providing was the the basis of it was actually the, exactly the same. I don't think it makes one more uh, accurate or one less accurate. I just think that we speak different languages, and as far as accuracy, it's something that I was taught that if you are 75 to 80 percent accurate, you are awesome. Right. The, I think that that's a high accuracy rate. There are going to be things that don't happen because somebody changes their mind on, you know, if if you are going to go to Cleveland and you go to um, California instead, something different is going to happen. And so we do have free will. And that is an element in readings that people don't often take into consideration. I can tell you what door number one, what door number two, what door number three is going to look like, but you're the one that's got to walk through it. And so there may be things that get lost in translation. But again, I feel the gist of what we're saying, it, it comes out really, like I said, 75 to 80% accuracy is pretty darn high. It is indeed. That's brilliant. I I love that. You're right. Free will, nobody thinks about it. So um, I will ask you too, what is the, because this ties into free will. What would you say is the number one topic that people come to you to get clarity on? Oh, without a doubt, it's romance. You know, it's, it's romance. Uh, it it has recently, I would say it's very closely tied with finance, but romance is usually the, the biggest thing. We all want to be loved. Uh, it is what we are the least secure as as people. Um, we all want to have better relationships. We all want to have better partnerships, better understanding in our relationships. And I think that's one of the things that we as psychics can do very well is to help people understand some of the nuances and what their partner needs and things like that. And so I would say that that's probably always holding the number one uh, rank there. But People are feeling insecure about their material places, too, these days, really a lot. And so that's climbing up to be really a close second. Definitely. I'm, I'm the, the same. That, for me, number one, romance, but also work is close. Neck yeah. and, neck. and I think for me, it's because I like delving into work situations. I love the dynamics and the personalities and how they into they're interwoven so i really enjoy looking at the business side of things um so they're neck and neck but yes romance is always the first and i say it ties in because free will during that kind of reading people mostly don't want to know about free will that he has free will or she has free will you you could do all the spells you want yeah but, the, you know, you mustn't dismiss the fact that you were given free will and so was that person. And that person will be acting on their free will. On their free will, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's tricky. Love is such a tricky, tricky thing. It is. It's the one area that we, no matter what age, 
no matter what your social strata, we all want to be loved. Absolutely. And relationships, not just love, we're talking friendships, family, all of it, work relationships. There are, I think they're what we're meant to really spiritually grow within. It's, I think some of our biggest life lessons come through relationships with other people. And that's tough to navigate. So I think people do have the wrong idea that, oh, everything should be easy. Friendships, family should be a breeze. After all, they're family. Yeah. yeah. But no, not necessarily. Some of the, your life lessons come through those conflicts. They um, sure do. And love is probably one of the biggest life lessons we can step yeah. into. So, okay, that's really interesting. So it must be worldwide. It must be a, you know, cultural ph phenomenon, a human phenomenon, I think. It is. Universal. Universal, that's what I meant. Yes, universal phenomenon. Everybody wants to be loved. And it's the one thing people struggle with probably the most, unfortunately. So now you've worked you've had so you've been on the biography channel the travel channel there's i'm just very fortunate i consider myself the luckiest girl in the world i really do um and so uh, i've been supported along the way i'm in new orleans that i'm sure is something that is uh, has assisted me along the way but um, the first TV that I did was back in the early 90s, and it was a show on A&E. And I just happened to be, the, you know, in the right place at the right time. And they brought me in as the medium. Um, I was working already and as a, and pretty established as a medium at that point. But um, it, just things like that happened. I've been on the Today Show a couple times. I've been in the Wall Street Journal. I just am fortunate. I, I think people um, really think of New Orleans as being a very spiritual place, a very haunted place, a very mysterious and mystical place. And so I'm here and I've been here. Um, I'm the second oldest reader in the city, uh, the second longest reading continually in the city. And so I think when you've been somewhere for a long time doing the same thing, you, you can, you, people know who you are. And so I, I really am very fortunate to have had the opportunities. And even though they were scary, being on television is frightening to me. It was. I was very nervous every time that I go on. It's very, oh, my gosh, I'm going to be on TV. And But I always say yes, and I do it anyway. And at this point, I just am very fortunate and, and very happy to be able to act as kind of an ambassador to this city in, in certain media. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Yes, that's wonderful because the more people know about the work, I think it may open up doors a bit, you know, for people. Maybe there is something else out there. So it's helpful when you do press. I think so, too. And in New Orleans, we really are. I'm a member of the community. It's something that in another city, it might be thought of as being weird. But in New Orleans, it's okay. I'm a member of, you know, the uh, New Orleans and Company, which is our Convention Visitors Bureau. I'm a member of the Chamber of Commerce, things like that. It's just much more mainstream, perhaps, here than in other parts of the world. Right. Carrie, what do you think about people who want to debunk mediumship yeah we in i would say in the in the defense of the skeptics right there are some people that are out there that do what we do or claim to do what we do who really screw people and so i think that it originally came about because there were um some people using uh, the title of psychics and mediums who were really taking advantage of people just like there are you know some people that use the the preface of being a pastor or a minister who are out there screwing people it's across the board 
Um, there are, you know, unscrupulous people in every profession. But I think that the skeptics came about because of that and to try to fight against that. So I'm not um, anti-skeptics. I'm not anti uh people that are out there trying to understand what it is that we're doing. And I think that's what leads to the wonderful research that's being done within the scientific community is that people are asking those questions. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when somebody is really uh, spewing a lot of vitriol about it, I don't quite understand that because it, it feels like they're, um, they're angry and 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 really resenting something that they may not understand and they don't understand that just because there's a couple of bad apples that doesn't mean that the whole bunch is bad and so i would just ask that people give us the respect of of uh you know give us the benefit of the doubt i i think that there are people out there, they make the news, you hear about, you know, psychic swindles, old lady for $500,000, and you hear about those things, and that's terrible. And it, it, but that's not what I do, and that's not what you do. And the same way that there are bank robbers out there, that doesn't mean everybody walks in a bank is there to rob it. So I would just hope that people would come to us with an open heart um, I don't mean that you you just, again, suspend all doubt and suspend all of your critical thinking, but I'm not trying to screw anybody. You're not trying to screw anybody. And do your due diligence before you go and see someone like us, and you'll see that there are people that are out there that have been doing this for a long time who are not trying to con you, who are not trying to exploit you, and that are there trying to be of service in the world. And there are some of us that are really out there doing that. And it's if you do your due diligence, you'll find us. Well said. Absolutely. Yes. Word of mouth is best. And how would people schedule a reading? Would they go to your website? And I will put all the links in the show notes. Oh, thank you. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they would start by visiting the website, neworleanspsychic.com. And all of the information about our services are on the website. Um, they can book either by email or by calling or texting. Um, and one of my assistants will be happy to get them scheduled uh, that way. And um, yeah, that's it. It's pretty easy. Excellent. And, you know, if people are visiting New Orleans, this would be a really good time to try and book in advance if you know you're visiting you could, because I'm sure seeing you in person, we can do both, you know, but yeah. seeing you in person must be a great experience as well. Well, I, I, I would, uh, I would say being in New Orleans is a great experience. So if I'm part of that, yay, that would be my honor. How was your Mardi Gras? My Mardi Gras was great. I actually finished my book uh, during Mardi Gras, so I sat it out. I went to see a couple shows, and so I did get out and dance a bit. But um, it was a beautiful, beautiful day. The weather was gorgeous. It was like 60 degrees and sunny, so the weather was just perfect. So it was a lovely, lovely Mardi Gras. It's such a high energy, positive, naturally positive experience. And if, if, if you haven't been to a Mardi Gras in New Orleans, you are missing out. I tell everybody, you must go at least once in your life. You so know. fun. So much fun. And you just meet people. People just talk to you. You meet everyone. If you think, oh, I don't know where to go, someone will tell you where to go. Yes. <laughs> but that's the friendliness as well of New Orleans. People are very, very friendly and very helpful. Um, they they just talk to you. So I thank you. Like yeah, that. thank you. We do. We love life, and so we love sharing that with everybody. Yeah, life and food. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Life and food. Yes, New Orleans is the place to be. Now, lastly, I just want to add a bit of a philosophical question. But if you, it may be hard to imagine, if you were born into this life. And you didn't have any psychic skills or mediumship skills. 
Um, and I know you believe everybody has them, but just imagine that this wasn't a part of your life. How do you think your life would be? What would your life be like? Oh boy, that's so interesting. I, um, boy, it's such an integral part of who I am. It's, it's a, it's a question that I would think I would have thought before, but I haven't. I, I, I think that um, what would I be? I, I maybe a philosopher, maybe an attorney, maybe, a, <laughs> maybe a funeral director. I, I. I really don't know. I'm not sure what a psychiatrist. I, I, I don't know. I really don't. It's such a. Um, I am so much who I am. I I can't even fathom what it would be like not to be. Mm, interesting. So you are doing your life's work, obviously. I feel that. I I feel that. I very much um, am. And in that groove, and again, feel so lucky to be able to do that. Yeah. And if there was a time, any time in the past, and I know people say, well, I'm happy in today, but is there a decade at all that you uh, have ever thought, oh, I would like to have lived during that time just to see what it was like? I would go back probably to... Um, Julius Caesar's Rome, as long as I was born into nobility. Interesting. What is it about that time? Uh, just the, um, the, there was also a lot of joy of life going on. Um, it was, uh, it, it was, there were great things, there were terrible things, but it was such, uh, an incredible, um, intellectual time uh, so much great thought philosophy uh rules law um celebration of of being connected to the the earth saturnalia all sorts of stuff going on i just have always felt some affinity to that oh that's so interesting so maybe there's a, i don't know if you believe in past lives but perhaps there's some oh. type of past life connection yeah. there I think so, probably so. It's funny, all of the, the professions that you mentioned that you might do are all spiritually connected. You know, philosophy, psychology, law, all the things that you mentioned, there's an element of life change within all of them. So even that's interesting. So you've got that thread of human thought, working with people, helping to effect change in some way, because that's what you do as a medium, as a psychic. And it sounds like you would have always done that. Well, thank you. I, and thank you for getting me thinking about that, because I, it, it, from, from your wrapping that up that way, you're right. It does all have a through line. And thank you for connecting those dots for me. Oh, well, it was, it's just an observation. It's just a... Um, hypothesis. It, it, it may not be, but that's how I see it. But it will be interesting to see what your roots are with New Orleans as well. And have you have you looked into that? Why why is your genealogy so embedded in that space? Well, it's a port city, right? And so everybody um, in my family, I am a, a real, uh, as they would say, Heinz 57 variety. Um, I have a lot of uh, different uh, ethnic mix mixture inside of me. And I think that that's something that New Orleans really, we are a melting pot. And I, in my um, genetic makeup, I'm definitely a melting pot. And so I think that it makes a lot of sense to be here um, in a place that it really, um, it doesn't, there's a saying that we have, it's not where you're from, it's where you're at, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a place where we accept everything and it becomes part of our fabric. Mm -hmm. And so I think that New Orleans uh, really does encompass that. And I, I feel very comfortable in, in that. And it's just more open 
perhaps than other places that are very rigid in their associations. Mm -hmm. We are, we really are a collective. Definitely. There's a strong base and connection there. Carrie, it's been fascinating speaking with you today and learning about your work and your life. And New Orleans is always and will always hold a special place for me. So I just couldn't wait to get you on the show. Um, oh, thank you. It's been my joy. And I'm sending you lots and lots, you and all of our listeners and viewers, lots and lots of good New Orleans mojo. Oh, mojo. Yes, we'll, we'll have that. Thank you. <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> Yay. Thank you so much. And um, yes, I hope you come back as well when your next book is written. Oh, I'm thank you so much. I would love to. And thank you so much for having me. I really, it's been my joy and honor. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe and comment and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.